I'm Rusty Komori, and this is Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. I was the head coach of the Punahou School Boys Varsity Tennis Team for 22 years, and we were fortunate to win 22 consecutive state championships. This show is based on my books, Beyond the Lines and Beyond the Game, and it's about inspiration, leadership, and building a superior culture of excellence. My special guest today is the author of Amazon's best-selling book, Get Up Girl. She is Sarah McFarlane, and today we are going beyond empowering women. Hey, Sarah, welcome to Beyond the Lines. Coach, <laughs> aloha. Thank you so much for having me on board. I've been watching all of your episodes for several years and have been learning so much. I'm excited to be on here and be part of this incredible community of business leaders that you continue to champion. Sarah, you are an incredible person with an incredible family, but I, I, I'm friends with your husband, Patrick, and I heard that he went over to Maui to volunteer to help some of the Maui victims. He did. Um, you know, it's it's been such a harrowing tragedy, what's gone on in Lahaina as well as Kula. And, you know, our hearts have just gone out with the Maui community. And uh, my husband ended up going, you know, he has such a big heart. And he ended up going out that weekend after the fires just to support and help with one of the local churches. He he did what he could. Um, and that was uh, to just help with some of the supplies that came in to distribute them and help as a security guard at night so everybody could sleep peacefully. And, you know, um, that was that was definitely something devastating that we're all going through with with Maui. So. Well, that's Patrick for sure. I mean, he's, he's a man <laughs> of great character. And Sarah, you have a beautiful family. I mean, your kids, Reagan, Victoria, I mean, so beautiful. And I want to know, Sarah, what what's the biggest reason why you're a successful mom? Well, thank you for that, Coach. Um, I you know, I think I'm always trying to strive to do better. I think we all are. So that means so much to me that outside looking and that you can give me um, some credit there. And and I, cause I think that as moms, we're always feeling like we can do better. Right. So uh, it really takes a village to raise a child. They say that, and it's true. Um, you know, I come from a blended family where we've got two moms and two dads, and we're all working really hard to raise our kids. And I think being on the same page coming from divorce has really helped to kind of set the tone for our family. And so I'm very blessed that I have an incredible other mom and um, we, you know, the kids also have Patrick as their dad and, and Corey. And so we're really blessed to, to make it work as, as a family. I think something that I've always taught the children is to think for yourself. I think that's the most important thing uh, that we're all on board as parents to teach the kids to think for themselves, to think outside of the box, to be independent of thought, and to really make sure that we're instilling value to them as as individuals, so they can be courageous in this in this era and have the value that they need, so that they can, like my book says, you know, to roar loudly and find their inner voice. Well, Sarah. As you know, I teach tennis to your two kids, <laughs> Reagan and Victoria, and they are just absolutely wonderful kids. I mean, you're right. I mean, it's it's teamwork as a family to really raise kids. But I also train you in tennis. And what do you what do you feel? Uh, what do you love about our tennis lessons the most? Um, I think for me, I. I think I just really love playing with you and we've kind of revolved the, our lives around that. I think it's important to note that when you can play with a champion, play with a champion. <laughs> and so we revolve our life around the opportunities that we have. And it, it didn't come in another sport. It came in tennis. And we have been very, very grateful to be able to do that as a family together. And you know, Patrick can even get on the court sometimes. The kids are there. We've made it a family sport. And so I enjoy everything that we're doing together um, from the team effort as a family that we are able to do with you. And that's on the court. That's off the court. I enjoy the coaching. 
but I also enjoy, I call you my counselor, my coach, um, you know, my friend of, you know, over 15 years, I think we've been playing. So it's more than just the game. It's, it's everything that's involved in it. And so thank you. Well, yeah, Sarah, we know each other for many, many years now. And I, can you share with our viewers um, just about why you've had a successful background in business and, and what that background in business was? Yeah, well, um, the background in business, I used to um, I used to work in politics from a young age. I did um, media relations, legislation, drafting, bill, bills, and um, came from that and then went into being a chief of staff for one of the state uh, local state representatives from there. Um, went back to school, originally was at Chaminade University for my undergrad, then went back to school, had had kids in the process, had my master's at Hawaii Pacific University for business, and then started two companies back together, um, back to back. Uh, one was called Landmark Logistics. Another was a distribution company that I did private label for private label uh, brands for two of the largest grocery chains here in Honolulu and, and was mass distributed on all the outer islands. Um, after that, I uh, moved to Nebraska with my new husband, Patrick, and uh, he, he has a his family has a large manufacturing company over there. And so I came to, he came to support and spend time with his family. And I picked up a development project, um, 10 acre parcel. I rezoned it, annexed it, did the entitlements, worked that project through and with the utilities, the grading, the sewer, the paving, all of that and sold it. And somewhere in between, I decided to write a book. And um, now I currently do consulting for M&A as well as succession planning. So, Sarah, I've, I've seen you in action through many of those years and many of those businesses. And I'm very impressed with you. Everything you do, you just make every every business better. I mean, that's that's your track record. And I want to know what what compelled you to write Get Up Girl? Um, Get Up Girl is is written. The inspiration behind it is to reach a demographic that um, for women and, and to offer within business, to offer um, perhaps a different approach to some of the modern day feminism that is out there right now. Um, it's a book that inspires through courage. It's a book that teaches how to get up. You know, it, it, it embraces healthy femininity without having to embrace the emasculation of our counterparts, you know, and I think women are looking for something to pivot that's um, healthy, you know, originally, uh, feminine, uh, modern day feminism has, has definitely changed and, and become a little bit more polarizing, but traditional feminism is really was a movement for equality for all. And that includes men as well. And, uh, I think we don't, I don't think we have to have one to have the other, you know, I don't think that, um, femininity and being a strong woman are antithetical qualities. I think, and I believe that you can have both, but I also think that it's important to raise up everybody around us. And that includes men, that includes other demographics and everybody around us. And I think that we can do that when, when we come from a healthy place within feminism, you know, I don't embrace the victimhood mentalities that come with it. Um, in certain regards, I champion, um, getting back up, you know, that's why the book is called get up girl and, and really being able to find your inner voice. And we do that through, it's done through identity and purpose and balance and addressing boundaries and what those healthy boundaries look like and how to implement them and um you know getting knocked down and and, and having to come back up time and time again and, and what that looks like and not to take things too personal in business but to really just be able to champion your voice and finding yourself through the process and really allowing yourself to go through that process and Sarah, what I love about your book, too, is it's great for men because men can have greater understanding about women. And Sarah, right now, the, the big popular movie is Barbie. Can you explain what the differences are in terms of the actual reality for women and feminism? Well, I, I did enjoy Barbie, you know, I, I liked some things in it and I, and I maybe didn't some other things, but overall, um, you know, 
I loved to see the shift in femininity being embraced again. And I love that because I, like I said, I don't think that angry feminism sells anymore. And I just don't think it's something that our younger generation is willing to embrace or to champion because it's angry. And we're all looking to be inspired. We're all looking to be hope filled. We're all looking to go on a journey together and lift each other up in this moment in time. And we're looking for those healthy leaders. And so what I really, I, you know, I take, I take things out of it. Um, I'd written my book three years ago and, and, and rewrote a lot of it this year, but, um, I do change, I do take some of the healthy things out. It, it kind of came out during, uh, the launch of my book. So I did include it just to, just so that I could be, um, modern and, and relevant in, in the times right now, but there are some things, and then there are some things that I think, we can do better. And, and it's always important for women to be able to evolve. And so my book is really uh, a stance of evolving within that modern femininity. Well, Sarah, you are definitely a role model for women empowerment. And what do you, what would you say are some keys for really finding your true identity? Um, identity is a lifelong journey. I think that we go on. Um, I think there's never been a greater moment in time to know who you are. We have an identity crisis with our youth. We have an identity crisis that is, um, very prevalent in society today. And that's why Instagram and social media and all the, all of these, um, out outside marketing companies and, and, and platforms really are able to monetize on that. You know, identity is a monetizing tool out there. And, um, if you don't know who you are, you will let the world to be able to tell you and label you on who you are and, and, and you'll be categorized and you will be labeled. And I think it's, it's important to know who you are, you know, why you tick the way that you tick, why you think the way that you think, what's your purpose, which is correlated to, to identity. You know, um, I think people are looking for leaders in this moment in time, and we've got to be able to give them something that's healthy, you know, as we're continuing to grow up, <laughs> as we're continuing to, to, to get older, you know, there are others that are looking up at us and what do we want to reflect in society today? And, and how does that, um, how does that look? You know, purpose and identity, they, they go, they should go hand in hand. And for me, I think throughout the journey, I didn't really know who I was. I identified as a woman in business. I I'm Korean, you know, and I'm, my father's, uh, you know, was in special forces. And so I was just raised a certain way, you know, I'm the daughter of a first generation American Korean woman. And so, you know, work harder and, and, you know, you get a B and it's an, it's, 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 it's an F, you know? So for me, um, there are good things that were taken from that as well. Um, but I, I think, a lot of who I was was wrapped in what I could do and what I produced. And the amazing thing about COVID-19 was that it gave us a time to pause. And if you were running so fast, like I was from one thing to the next, you had to be forced to just stop and, and, and go through the process. And, and when there's not all that much around you, you know, you can't really hide behind things. You couldn't really hide behind things in COVID-19. You had to really embrace who you were. And so for me, that was extremely healing. And I, I took advantage of it. I, I, I went and I was on the mainland at that time. And I, I went from one, one corner of the U S to the next, and then back again, we did the whole van life thing, traversed the U S and, um, this was at a very difficult time for our country where it was on the shootings of Breonna Taylor and um, um, George Floyd. And for me, that was a really harrowing moment. I like in the Lahaina fires and the, and the Kula fires for me, just such a difficult time. You know, you want to do more and you, you want to do what you can to help. And um, that was such a such a hard time for me in the same way um that time in our history was such a divisive moment was very difficult for me to overcome and i really needed to understand it on the ground level and so i went on this journey and this trip and we went to um those places we went to st louis we went to louisville you know i i went to the colorado mining towns and the little towns in tennessee and we went to la you know we went everywhere just so i could gain a better understanding of the moment that i was living in we slept where lions slept you know we swam with beavers and uh got 
got knocked on our, our camper van a couple of times by the police, you know, had to get dug out of the sand. I mean, it was just such a remarkable moment in time. And, and as free as I ever would be in that moment is kind of where I found a little bit of my identity, where I was just unhinged from the mechanisms of control that really had me, where I always had this this idea of what I was supposed to be. And it was kind of the first moment in my life where I was like, I, I want to break free. <laughs> it was my very big, big girl <laughs> break free moment of work and everything that I thought that I was supposed to be. And I found a greater purpose on that journey. And that was um, where I had birthed Let Love Be Greater, which is the 501c3 foundation for me that helps to empower women through education. And um, it, it, it's, you know, along that, along that path is where I found that. And sometimes we need the calm and we need just the stillness to be able to allow ourselves to go through that process. And that's what it did for me. Well, Sarah, you're obviously very adventurous <laughs> and very cultured for sure. And Sarah, when you reflect back on your life so far, What's one or two big adversities that you dealt with that you overcame? I faced a lot of adversities. Um, I think as women, we all do. As people, we all do. As humans, we all do. And um, I've tried to buy companies. I've put eight months into things. Didn't work out, you know, only for the door to be slammed in my face. I've um, been sued. (laughs) I've had to lawyer up at times. Um, I've been backstabbed. I've been um, had distributions just stopped in one season of my life and, and had to sell a development during COVID the list, you know, I could go on and on and on. Um, but I think as women, we all have to go through those things, you know, and, and as business, business owners, we all have to go through those things and to find ourselves pitying or to find ourselves backed up into a corner and, um, you know, not, not being able to move and, and, and find ourselves in an ability, in an inability to mobilize. It's not where you want to be, you know, adversities come and adversities go and they make you stronger. And it's an, it's an important part of life. You know, so much of what your books have been written about, you know, you have to be able to, to be that champion, to get back up, to get back up time and time again, no matter what's happened to you, if you allow it, they will indubitably, um, be your end story, but you can also use what's happened to you to be the beginning of your story. And I think adversities are great like that. I've been through some things, but they don't make me. They they have given me a voice to promulgate what um, I want to champion in this season. And I think that's what we, you know, we need to do if we're pioneering. And that's what it is to be a leader. You know, you're gonna you're gonna be able to pivot and to find these areas that you really want to champion. And it's it's going to be from coming through some gritty things. You know, we've gone through some stuff, uh, coach, you've gone through some things, you know, in order to get where you are, you've had to go through some things. And so the adversities are really, um, I feel like it's just a platform to launch into, you know, all the things that you want to become. Sarah, I love hearing all your insights and Sarah, you have both of my books and, um, I love how you just mentioned about adversities and, and, you know, Obviously, you know that I talk about welcoming adversities and looking forward to challenges because when it happens and we deal with it, we become a stronger person for that experience. We become smarter. We become better. What are some things that stood out to you in the books? Um, so much stood out in the books. I I think I told you before, but I love I love book number two. You know, I love. Um, I just I felt like things just continued to get get better, you know, from beyond the lines, beyond the games. And I think, um, one of the most impactful stories for me reading it, because, you know, I'm, I'm basing my, my book on getting up is when you were in your Missouri championship game. And I think you had, you had a rolled ankle, you had something that was going on with your ankle and and you were winning up until that point. And then you started to lose because you were in a lot of pain. And, um, the coach ended up coming out and saying, you know, don't look at the things that you don't have, you know, begin to see what you, what you've got. And I thought that was so profound because so often we're looking at what we don't have you know, versus what we do have. And so you began to pivot, you began to change up your game a little bit, you know, you began to shift the way you're hitting the ball and the way that you're holding the racket. And you began to use um, what you still had to be able to produce momentum in the game. And you ended up winning that championship and you ended up having that goal become that reality. And I thought, 
that was so powerful because you persevered through something that was seemingly impossible and extremely excruciating and difficult to do. And yet you didn't allow your circumstances to dictate how you were going to win. You chose, you, you, you focused in on what you wanted to do. And that was the outcome. And I love that because so often we get down. So, so often we've got um, issues and things that we can't do because we're looking at, well, I can't do this. I can't do that. I don't have this. I don't have that. You know, I don't have the proper funding. I can't get the bank loan. They're not going to do business with me. I'm not enough of what they're looking for. I don't have the talent. You know, we're always looking at what we don't have, but it's a great reminder to just focus on what you do have. You know, I am going to be this, I am going to fit the role. I can win the end game. And I think having that, just that self-fulfilling prophecy ends up coming to pass. Well, Sarah, I love that you love that story about me playing against the University of Missouri. And yeah, that's what Coach Ed's advice to me was. He said, you know, instead of worrying about things that you can't do, focus on things that you still can do. And that was probably the biggest, best advice I ever got. And I'm sharing that with so many of my teams that I was coaching. And you know, I could have easily fell into the victim mindset. And yeah. you and I both talk about the differences between being a victim versus being a victor. Now, what are your thoughts about uh, trading in victimhood and fear uh, for a healthy mindset? Um, I I love the... I'll start with this because I really loved it. I loved the Arnold Schwarzenegger documentary um, in Netflix. And Arnold shares with you his past. He's like, I've been abused and I've been all these things. And he's like, boo-hoo, you know? And I was like, oh, <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> but he said, you know, I use, he used what's happened to him. He said, you have a choice. You can either use what's happened to you to break you or to make you. You have a choice. You have that choice. That's powerful because I don't think we realize how powerful we have our, our abilities are, you know, the power of our own choice, the power of the way that we look at each other and how we view our own selves. And, and he said, so I chose to take everything and, and use it as the fuel. And that's exactly what he did. He used everything that had happened to him to be the fuel and, and the driving motivation for the success that he had achieved. And obviously he, su he succeeded in everything that he did. And I, and I feel like that's, that's, that's something that's very related to, to our life. You know, we can choose to have fear. We can choose to be the summation of the things that have occurred in our lives, or we can choose to overcome them. We have that choice. You know, we can choose fear or we can choose to have courage. And if you choose courage, it's going to, you, you're going to have to overcome some things and you're going to have to be willing to face those fears and to overcome victimhood because victimhood is soul crushing. There is no end game in victimhood. You know, it's, Yes, you can embrace these ideas, but ultimately you're embracing losing, you know, and, and as you know, coach, everything about your books is about winning and being the champion. You know, it's, it's not about um, being good. It's about being great. <laughs> it's about being the best. And so victimhood is ultimately soul crushing. It, it leads to nowhere. And um, we need to begin to champion winning. We need to begin to champion champions. We need to begin to champion, um, something that that will be able to lead this generation out of so much of that type of thinking and that fear. I totally agree with you, Sarah. And Sarah, what would your advice be to women or just people that are dealing with failure? Um, I, you know, I wrote in my book, um, get up, get up, girl, <laughs> but get up, fight, get beat. Rise, repeat, fight, overcome, win. I think that we've we've got to get up and we've got to push through and we've got to be able to go forward and and no matter how many doors shut in your face, because there will be doors that shut in your face and they're they're gonna slam and you're gonna have failures and you're gonna you're gonna have these moments in time where um, you're gonna feel hopeless, but it's important to be able to persevere. It's important to choose to persevere. It's important to allow that momentum to go forward. And if there's a mountain in front of you, you know, find a way to get through to the other side. You know, get, crawl, <laughs> get, dig through it. You know, go around it, climb up it. You know, summit the top. But whatever you need to do, 
get over to the other side. Don't allow that mountain to be that just that big thing that stands in front of you and your success. You know, don't allow the closed doors to be the end game for you. You know, out of every hundred deals that you've got, you just need one. And um, a lot of, and, and that's statistically within PE, private equity, a lot of times it's, you know, you've got a hundred deals going through and, and just that one goes through that, that you need. And so even if you get the doors slammed, somebody's going to eventually say yes. You know, it's, it goes to the persistent victor. It goes to the one that has effort. You know, intellect means nothing without effort. I tell that to my son all the time. You know, he's, he's a smart boy. He's, he's a brilliant boy. Um, but um, as we've seen at, at times, I tell him, you know, it means nothing. It means nothing to have, have intellect if you can't persevere, if you can't get back up. And I think um, have that effort. I reward the effort. I don't reward his, his intellect. And I think that's important for our younger generation because a little bit of wind, a little bit of storms just knock us off our feet, you know, a little bit of rejection and, and we're not able to get up and, and go forward. But being able to push through those moments is so invaluable and so important. Now, Sarah, in terms of finding balance, I mean, being an entrepreneur and balancing family, personal life, what is your advice for people to find balance with their career and their family, personal life? Well, I think balance is like a seesaw and, you know, nobody has fun when there's too much weight on one side. And so you just have to reshift. You have to refocus. You've got to reapportion those things. And I think it's important to know your boundaries, know when to say no, you know, saying yes to everything doesn't, doesn't make people value you more. In fact, it's the opposite. If you say yes to everything, people end up taking you for granted, you know? So having healthy boundaries is extremely important. And when balancing, don't get your blueprint from social media because it's not true. It's a lie. <laughs> you only see what they want you to see. You know, that that mom that's baking those cookies, eating them and running her empire and raising those kids. She's probably got a team to run that empire. She's working out for five hours after she's baked those cookies and ate them, you know, and she's got it hired au pair. So, you know, don't compare yourself because comparison truly is the killer of dreams. Don't compare yourself to social media. Don't get your blueprint from it. Balance will not be found from it. And, um, you know, when, when you need to rebalance, just shift some things. Know when the season to build is. Know when the season to focus on your family or your health, your spiritual, mental, physical. Know when it is time to um, make that company again. And so knowing the seasons and understanding how to say no I feel like is extremely important in balancing. Sarah, I I got to say you nailed it right there. I mean, you're so right about saying no. So many people want to say yes and and that just kind of wears on them and I mean, I know that you and I both whatever we do, we want to do it to the best, the highest quality that we can. And and Sarah, I want to I want to really thank you for taking time to be on the show today. I'm so proud about, you know, your book and I want everybody to go out there and get it and just want to thank you for taking time to be on the show today. Thank you, coach. Well, I'm honored and I've gotten to learn so much from you. And like I said, you've been an incredible coach um, and counselor and friend and so it's been invaluable. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. And thank you for watching Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. For more information, please visit RustyKomori.com, and our books are available on Amazon. I hope that Sarah and I will inspire you to create your own superior culture of excellence and to find your greatness and help others find theirs. Aloha.